but, and so in a way you were blessed in that it was in, in that you had the, the 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 smallness of the film but in another way you were you were cursed because by the time it came out it was the old the old the new regime at the studio was just yeah. looking to kind of you know get out the old regime exactly. stuff and, and then move on to yeah because David Putnam he because of that kind of tricky year he had here in Columbia by the, by the time our film was finished he had uh, he had he had exited Columbia. Uh, and so a film that was shot in British Columbia I didn't stand the chance, <laughs> that's for sure. So as far as I know, it wasn't it wasn't very well promoted or marketed, or uh, and most of his most of the things that happened that year were allowed just to to fade away. Hmm. I, 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 have, I have a question actually. I'm going to take advantage of the microphone here. <laughs> uh, throughout most of your films, it seems like. Basically, everybody is a good person. Uh, more, I mean, I was describing Gregory's Girl to a friend, and I was telling her that it's a really unusual film because everybody is more or less good. Everyone, you know, you kind of keep expecting the the coach to to not let her on the team, but they end up dancing in the locker room and just all those wonderful sequences of characters living their lives and I was wondering how that comes together in your storytelling if you you know without a crushing villain that's you know trying to destroy the team or or destroy the town it's sort of yeah there are no villains in your films no well in, in a funny way I mean I, and um, I, I still suffer for it, from it personally because I know that at home I, I, I'm always accused of having Seeing everyone's point of view, <laughs> you know. So, uh, to my mind, that's that's the way things are. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think who said it, but someone said everyone has their reasons, you know, for being what who they are and what they do. Jean Renoir. Was it Renoir? Yeah. Um, so it's it's that kind of thing. But it's it's to me, it's just it's it's kind of infantile to have baddies and goodies really in life because. It, it, because uh, once again, the other old cliche thing about you walk a mile in my shoes and find out who I am that way. That so you have to consider all these things. So uh, I suppose you can take it to a bad point and just have everyone being quite bland and nice to each other. But um, and, I'm, and I'm quite happy to concede that it might be um, a, a kind of a deficiency in me that I do tend to see everyone's reasons for being who they are in, in, at that precise moment. Uh, and it does it does bring about a lack of tension and a lack of drama, uh, which are other problems. Um, I remember when I was writing the script for Local Hero, and um, my friend who was the uh, associate producer on Ian Smith, um, I was feeding him the pages before I was feeding the pages to Putnam because you know I was getting his take on things, and I, I was giving him maybe ten pages at a time, and I got to about page forty, and he. And he it was on the, we had a telephone call about it, and um, he said, "Yeah, it's going well. You know, the characters are coming along." He says, "But you haven't got any conflicts in it." And the funny thing was, I had a little conflict motif in the two previous films that I'd made. There was reference to conflicts and characters eating conflicts and things. And I said, "No, I'm getting away from the conflicts. I'm not doing con <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing conflicts anymore." And he said, "No conflict." I said, "Conflict." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, conflict." And I'm all said, what's that? And he said, well, you know, people, we know, you know. I said, all right. He says, you need that in the film. I said, all right, okay. <laughs> so that's when I had the notion of having the other villagers uh, react against the old man who doesn't want to sell the beach. So, uh, And they kind of set this thing up. But it hadn't occurred to me that you needed conflict in that, in that hard and fast way. Uh, maybe it's true. Maybe you do need it. I don't know. But... I suppose between the girls there's a certain amount of conflict, but then you're seeing both of the points of view, so then it falls apart. I don't know. Well, it's also very much a kind of internal thing, isn't it? And if there's yeah. the conflict, if anybody with, with, with Ruthie maybe recognizing that uh, Sylvie is mad and possibly she is too, if the, there's a possibility of that. Yeah, uh huh. And then uh, the thing about being bad to someone is you're bad to them, then you regret it. So yeah. you weren't really all that bad after all. But then these are nice things. You yeah. get that kind of poignant thing going. It seems to me that Sylvie's uh, 
speech about about the pain, sadness, and Ruthie's life is, and why not, and why yeah, should course, there be? Yeah, of course, of course, she said. Yeah, that's what she says. Yeah. That, that that to me really kind of sums up your films. Mm -hmm. A lot of them so beautifully. It's mm -hmm. a really wonderful moment. <laughs> Well, that was from the book. That was from the book. I mean, the, as I say, most of the dialogue on the film is from the book as well. Now I know why re you responded to it so strongly. There's somebody in the balcony, and then continue. I should have asked this yesterday about local Harry. But as I was trying to sleep last night, I was really wondering about Marina, and how magic. What? How? how what did you mean for her to be really a magic? Uh, in. In local hero, is is Marina really a mermaid in local is she? Um, <laughs> what I, I I would say no. You know, being being brutally honest, I would say no. She's just a girl who had webbed feet. Uh, <laughs> but 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 that doesn't that doesn't take away from wherever you know someone watching the film wants to go with it. You know. Um, and, and a great ability to hold her breath for long times in her life. Yeah. Uh -huh. there was, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or somebody down here. Yeah, I was introduced to, to your work from uh, to, from Local Hero, and um, I think it's a great uh, experience um, seeing you here, because I'm from California. I just happened to be here for the weekend, checking out the University of Rochester. But um, I noticed that your films seem to have um, a certain amount of humor in them. And you, as people could tell from you know laughing throughout, throughout the film, but um, some of these seem to try so hard to get the laughs, and I, I don't get that from your films. And do you do you feel that the humor comes like in house comp uh, housekeeping? Did it come from the the novel, or is is that is that your own little touch? Uh, yeah, I think I think if you're dealing in things that are that uh, are authentic, then I mean, humor is just a resource that people use in the same way that they use anger or patience or uh, you know the ability to not see something when they should see something. But it's just one of these things that we use to get by, you know, with, with each other. So I think if you use humor in that level, then it's just part of the, the, the bag of tricks that we, that we all kind of utilize. It's only when you try to, make, to kind of take it out of its range, you know, and turn a, a whole situation into humor for no good reason, for no authentic reason, that, that it starts to show, you know. Uh, so, so that's all I, was, that I can really say about it. Uh, if you're making an out-and-out -out comedy, then you're exploiting just that one aspect of you know being human as it were. Um, but I tend to want to use the whole range of you know what, what it means to interact with other people. Uh, humor's part of it, really. That's all. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Yeah, one of the things that uh, I thought was especially impressive about um, this film, and I'd, I'd say about Local Hero, too, is the pacing uh, of the films. Um, they both, I think, and maybe especially this one, just move forward in um, a way that uh, feels very fluid, feels very lifelike, and nothing happens too soon, nothing happens too abruptly. Um, and it gives the film, you know, a very kind of lifelike quality, while at the same time, I mean, maybe not as sort of hyped up dramatic kind of thing as, you know, one sort of expects out of sort of more kind of, kind of conventional Hollywood sorts of films. And um, I was just wondering, I mean, how you work to, to achieve that, because, I mean, it seems that a lot of that would have to go into a kind of editing process to be able to get that sort of rhythm uh, that has a sort of slow, <laughs> leisurely, kind of lifelike pace, and yet not, you know, extraneous scenes, not things that sort of feel like they're just dead weight. Mm. Well, as, as a process, and, and uh, uh, probably I, I've, I was dry kicking and screaming to get it to this uh, <laughs> state, because it probably was maybe 20 minutes longer to begin with. Uh, uh, and, and it's nice to know that it's preserved that, that rhythm, because uh, usually at the end of a process, I always feel the films are, have been cranked up too much, you know, just by the fact that you have to squeeze everything into, you know, an hour and a half or an hour and 45. And contractually, you know, you've signed a contract to say you'll deliver two hours and mm. you've got to take 10 minutes out to make that. Um, so it's, 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 it's gratifying to know that they still have that rhythm to